Hello, everybody. This is Tiffany with the Speak Up and Inspire series. And tonight, I am very honored to have some of my sisters in the community to talk about domestic violence and going from being survivors to thrivers. Um, tonight, we are going to have the pleasure of talking to Miss Andrea Merriman, Miss Alicia Richardson, Miss Lakeisha Steele, Miss Nicole Williams, Miss Katrina Thomas, and Miss Radia Johnson. So tonight we are here and we're going to be talking to you live, very candid, and we're going to have some serious conversations tonight. Um, and all of the ladies are going to share how they went from um, surviving domestic violence to thriving now in today's world as we speak. <laughs> this right now is October Domestic Violence Month. And even though it's Domestic Violence Month and everybody is raising awareness about domestic violence, we want to make it very clear by the time that we finish this panel tonight that domestic violence is not just for October. We don't want to just raise awareness during October. Um, domestic violence is a national threat to humanity. It's a national threat to families. And so we want to make sure that all of you know exactly what domestic violence is, the effects of it, um, what you can do to help yourself if you are in a situation that um, is abusive, how you can help others, and then ways that you can become a thriver as a survivor. So ladies, we're going to go ahead and jump right in. We were having technical difficulties, so I don't want to waste any time. Um, what I want to do is just go from um, one queen to another, and if you can tell us really briefly, which I know is kind of hard, but kind of briefly what your story is um, so everybody can get to know you and know where you, where you came from. Um, and we'll start off with Miss Andrea. Can you share your story with us briefly so we can get a a snippet of who you are, Ms. Andrea. Thanks for having me, Tiffany. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Andrea Merriman, and I am a domestic violence, I say master domestic violence help coach. And I started into the domestic violence arena um, in 2014 when I was thrust into it by the murder of my 17-year-old daughter by her brother-in-law. So when that happened to me, I had to make a decision on whether to crawl in a corner and be and stay in mama zone or use that as I started listening to things and started hearing because I didn't realize that it was such a pandemic status as it is. And I start hearing things like one out of four, and now they're saying one out of three females will be have experienced domestic violence in their lifetime, one out of six men. And the really ugly part that got me was two out of three female homicides are done by a family member or spouse. And I knew that something had to be done. So, and I wish that no other mother would have to bury a child. And especially one that had her life ahead of her she was only 17. She had never done anything to this person, but yet because he was upset because his wife, which was my older daughter, had left him, that he chose to invade my home and do the dastardly things that he did. So I started to make that differently by creating the Jennifer Warren Merriman Health Program and now working with advocates and servant leaders because the other thing I found out is that there's no support out there for leaders. That there's people starting to tell their stories. There's people out there trying to learn all they can about domestic violence so they can do the give back, but there's no, no one supporting them. And so that's where I am and that's what I do now um, with training, workshops, personal development training. But the whole thing is there's, it's time for us to have these type of discussions, quit victim blaming and start having conversations around what can we do in our own communities to make a change. Very nice, very nice. Um, we're gonna move along. I'm well, gonna hold questions for later so we can get through introductions. <laughs> um, next, Ms. Alicia Richardson, can you share with us your story? Uh, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Alicia Richardson. Everyone calls me Lee. I go by Lee. And basically, 
I am originally from Baltimore, Maryland, and I live now in Charlotte. And I had to move from there because I felt stuck. I felt stuck because I was going from one relationship to another relationship that was abusive. I also grew up in an abusive home. So by me growing up in an abusive home, that was like my norm that I see my mom be abused. I see my aunt be abused. So I never thought, well, I, that's not going to be me. And actually it was me. And I think also because it's like when you grow up in a situation, you feel as though, yeah, I'm not going to deal with that. But then when it happens to you, it happens because you, your mo you get so caught up in it because with mine, I was like wine and dine and shower with so many gifts. And then it got to the point where I became isolated from my family, isolated from my friends. And I didn't even realize it until it got to the point where it was like, I haven't even spoke to my mother in like so long. I haven't spoke to my sister in so long. And it's like, I talked to them every day. And he put me in a place where that you don't need them. You just need me. And it's like, okay, <laughs> you know, and it by me being isolated and secluded is to get me to the point where I am going to be broke down mentally because I was, then once I got broke down mentally, the physical abuse was easily able to start. And a lot of, what I don't understand was when, when it comes to domestic violence is how people always play, well, why you don't just leave? Why you don't just leave? Because it's not like you just walked in the door and then a punch just came to your face. It's like, oh no, I ain't dealing with this. It's because you, they catch, it's like being a spider, how a spider do a web. And they put you in this web so that you feel as though when you leave, you you don't you don't know what to do. And sometimes it's so hard to leave because you could be in a situation where they controlling you financially, where they taking your money, where they trying to control your finances. Then your mental is already gone and broke down, and it's just so hard. And it's like you got to try to find out who you are. And doing that is hard because I lost every part of me. I didn't want to look in no mirror. I couldn't look in none because I had to face me. By me facing me, I had to see what I was going through, what I was dealing with. And I didn't want to. I became really suicidal, really depressed. I didn't, I didn't love me no more because I felt like if I love me, why am I even accepting this? And it was just so hard that it took for... One last incident, which was Valentine's Day, 2009, when the police came to the house and was like, okay, are you, are you done now? And I really thought I was going to die that day. So I had to tell, of course he fled as always. And I had to tell um, the police officer, it was a lady. She gave me a pamphlet and was like, I want you to actually go to this session. It's a therapy session. And I called it like, literally not right away probably like a week or so later but prior to that so many polices came to the house so many times that they knew me by my they, they knew my whole name because they was always there and I think another part of what made me feel like I cannot do this no more is the fact that I didn't want my children to go through what I had to go through growing up and I was like my children deserve to have a mom and this man is going to kill me or I'm going to die anyway. And he used to say that I sounded stupid when I used to be like, um, just go ahead and kill me because I'm already dead. And he'd be like, you sound so stupid talking like that. And it's like, well, I'm already dead inside. You By you adding the bruises to me just don't even matter anymore because I'm, I'm gone inside. I'm numb. I'm dead. I don't want to live no more. So just go ahead and end me. And he used to just talk, tell me how stupid I was for saying that and all of that. But it's like when you're in a situation where someone is already beating you up mentally and physically and emotionally and just stripping you all the way, what do you have left? No matter how much you're trying to. So that's how I felt. And the thing about it is I felt embarrassed. I felt like someone was going to judge me. So I didn't reach out to no one. I didn't know who to reach out to. I didn't know who to talk to. Because I, I thought they was going to say, well, you stupid for even being in the, the situation. Why don't you just leave? Why are you still there? And I didn't want to hear that because it's like, you know, 
some of the things that you need to do, you just don't know how. And you feel like you don't have the support. You don't, you feel like you're the only one going through it. So by me actually taking the time to call that number and I realized, oh my gosh, is this is domestic violence. There's so many other people going through this. I thought I was by myself. I thought I was alone and I wasn't. And by me even going through that and experience it, let me know that you're not alone. And it took me until I actually moved to Charlotte that I realized I had a story to share and I needed to share my story with others. And then I started learning how to actually love me, build on me, find out who I am, what I like inside and out. So that's why I have, I am so big on loving yourself wholeheartedly inside out because it starts inside. And you could put, no matter how much makeup you put on the outside, if you're not feeling good inside, that doesn't matter. It really doesn't. And I used to think that. So it's like, no, I have to feel good inside so it can show outside. So I am real big on hashtag me first because it starts with me loving me inside and out. Very nice. Very nice. Um, Miss Katrina, can you briefly share your story with us? Um, yes. Good evening, everybody. I'm Katrina Thomas. Um, I'm originally from Washington, D.C., and then I moved to Georgia in 2004. In that time frame, I met someone that I was in a relationship with, and um, it was actually nine and a half years, and I'm kind of just like everyone else. I went through the mental, the emotional, the sexual, um, it was very hard for me because I was the only one here on my side of the family. So I was totally dependent on this man. And the abuse started just like it always does. It, it starts out, you're being wined and dined and you're, you're being adored and, oh, you know, baby, I love you so much and I want to take you out and I want to shower you with all these gifts. It started out like that. And I thought I found the love of my life, but after a while, everything just changed. I came into that situation where he had three children. So I was like a stepmother um, and my abuse wasn't just with him. It also consists of the children, but the girls were more on my side, but Starting with him, he started to not want to take me anywhere. The, the showering of gifts stopped. Um, I was being humiliated. I was being talked to as if I was nothing. So imagine just like Alicia said, I felt like nobody cared about me and no one understood my story. I was working for JC Penney at that time and I was a manager in the salon. So I would go to work ladies with marks where he had beat me up if I would not do as he said do what he wanted with the children and he would just constantly act like I was nothing I mean this man was also sleeping around so I went through that I had to deal with that and I fell into so much depression and it was like if I spoke up or said anything to him he would downplay me and say, well, you're nothing. Don't worry about nothing. Nobody don't need to see you. So no one needs to know who you are. No one doesn't really, you've been out there. And I said, well, you used to treat me like this. You used to take me out and all that. When I went out now, I wasn't even introduced as his partner. I, I, I was just dilated with things of saying like, you don't even exist. And in the home, I felt like a slave. I was told what I needed to have done from cooking to dressing to, to getting the kids prepared for school. The, the, the stepchildren that came over were coming over on the weekend. He got to the point where then I couldn't even see my friends or my family. I was isolated from them all together. My phone calls were screened. If I even sounded like I was doing anything out of the sort that he didn't approve of saying anything and giving anybody a hint of what I was going through, he would, he, I remember one situation, he 
literally choked me. He pushed me down on the bed and choked me till I could not breathe. And I said, please, please let me up. I said, okay, I'm sorry. I did the wrong thing. I won't talk to my family. I won't say anything against you. This man literally bit me in the middle of my head while he was choking me. And I, I remember thinking in my mind, wow, I'm really nothing. If someone can bite me in my head, I mean, literally bite my head and I had to get stitches. And I tried to make phone calls. I tried to scream. And, and from that one situation went on to me having forcible sex and then constantly, ladies and gentlemen, having a relationship where a man just constantly secured me. I used to stay locked up in my room because I felt like I don't have a life. So well, let me just take myself and stay isolated in this room and don't come out. But I knew I had to cook. I knew I had to clean. I knew I had to have things prepared as if I was a wife. And I was just like, wow, Katrina, why are you going through this? And I had to say myself, one thing I realized is that it wasn't just coming from him, you guys. It came from the two sons. The two sons idolized their father so much that they started to abuse me mentally and emotionally. And I could never tell them what to do. They would fight me. One child even went as far to my son, my, my youngest son, Dominic, to tell him how much he would pull out a gun. I, I've never went this deep in my story. I'm just giving you pieces of it right now because you guys need to know about abuse. And the kids, the, the two boys felt like, oh, yeah, I'm doing this to you, Katrina. You can't say nothing. I couldn't say anything, you guys. I was silenced from any opinion, anything that needed to be done in that house. That house was not mine. It was considered to be his and them boys. The girls, they felt my pain. They felt my pain, and they used to come and cry with me. I used to cry in the middle of the bed and say, God, please, what can I do to get away from the situation? But what I didn't understand was that I didn't even love myself because I had lost myself in the situation and what led me to this man is because of things I went um, through in my younger years of abandonment and, and rape and that situation but moving forward I just didn't understand and I never settled that situation that happened until I met this guy and I just continued on and felt like I'm supposed to give all of me and 10% and more of me to the him or any man that I went through this for years and years and years. I stayed in this abusive relationship, getting smacked, getting choked, getting pulled downstairs from the top all the way to the bottom by my hair, by my hair, literally. And I had to endure that for nine and a half years until one day I just woke up and said, Trina, you have to love you. You have to love you. I prayed and I prayed. I always trusted and had faith in God, but I didn't really act on it at that time because I felt like, hey, God not helping me now. I'm here, I'm stuck and he's not doing nothing to help me, but I had to surrender and, re and say, God, I wanna trust you because I need to get out of this. and it wasn't just me suffering. My son was suffering. He was going through it. He was seeing this every day. He was constantly arguing with this man because of his mother and standing up and fighting him. So it was a battle through the whole household. And I just had to walk out one day and I happened to be uh, going out to the grocery store my eyes were full of tears and I think I had a black eye that day and there was a pastor in the parking lot walking and they were trying to invite people to their new church in other words and I talked to Pastor Dale and Pastor Tia when I tell you guys that was a whole change right there for me it's like that man knew my story without me even opening my mouth and I said he said you need to come to church and I said, well, I don't know. What is, what is that going to do? And I said, he said, do you believe in God? I said, yes, I do. He said, well, I want to see you Sunday. I went to that church that Sunday, you guys. And I sat way in the back because I said, I don't want to sit in the front. I don't want everybody to see me and be like, oh, look at her. And, you know, you know, people want to get in your business. I was so low key. Nobody knew what was going on with me for nine and a half years, you guys. So. 
I'm sitting back there minding my business. I'm just like, okay, you know, I'm listening. I'm getting into the word and I'm crying tears because we know when things speak to your heart and you know it's about you and you're going through it, those tears start to flow. I don't care how much you try to fight it, it's going to come. And the tears start to flow and I was sitting there wiping my eyes and trying to hold my head down. Please, nobody come back here. He pulled me to the front, you guys. And I said, oh my God. I said, I don't want to go to the front. I'm embarrassed. I don't want to stand up. I don't want to talk. I don't want to do nothing. And then not even that. I thought he was going to walk into the church because I told him I was going to church, but he was at work. And when I got up in front of the church, it's like something came over me. I just cried and I poured out and he laid hands on me and talked. You guys, when it comes to that situation where you realize I'm tired of being tired, Katrina went home that day after church. I prayed and I prayed in the middle of my bed, even thinking about suicide on many numerous occasions, you guys. But that day I decided I wanted God to enter me and to take me away from that situation and, and guide me. And I had to start to journal and write things down. I was writing my feelings down because as I told you guys, nine and a half years, not a sibling, not a, my mama, my dad passed. Nobody knew. So I just had to write and I would write and I would sit and just what I write, I would read it out to myself and say, you know, Trina, get it together. You got to do this. I would have to hide that stuff so he wouldn't see it. But then I just got to a point where I said, I'm tired. I walked out with nothing but my clothes, you guys. I took nothing with me, just me and my child and said, I gotta go. This is the only way. I mean, I walked, I cried and I teared up and I finally walked away from it. But as you walk away, I still had to decide to fix Katrina, to get Katrina in a place where I knew I was worthy of my love of anybody, where I had to break the chains and say, God, I can't keep pushing people away because I'm humiliated of what I'm going through. It's not that. It's not my fault. We blame ourselves. And I blame myself even after I left because I had to start the process of rebuilding Katrina Thomas. And that process started with a lot of work, a lot of doing self-care for me, letting me start with loving me again, realizing that all that was said and done to you wasn't your fault. So I did that. I just kept writing and writing. And then as time went on, I started building myself up and I started feeling better about myself. I never used to know how to have fun anymore. When I went around family, I used to tell people, I think Tiffany, you heard me say this. I was the best actress. I said, boy, I need a award. I used to go home and laugh. I need a award because I can put on a good acting scene. <laughs> and I used to cry about it and say, wow, Katrina, you're saying you're an actress? <laughs> but that's how I felt, you guys, because I had to put on a scene. So therefore, every moment was not me. But when I finally just said, you can smile again, you can love again, you can let people in and, and, and share. I have shared my story to the point where now I know this is about surviving and thriving, but that's not what I call myself. I am a survivor. I went through that stage of surviving, but now what I call myself is an overcomer because I look back and I know that's in my past now. That's not who I am. That's what made me who I am today sitting before you guys. I am a woman of courage. I am a woman of strength and I show others how to do that. That made me sit down and say, you need to be a voice for the voices. You need to, what is it that I can do to show people? You don't have to be alone. You don't have to suffer by yourself. You can learn the steps of doing things. I have worked and taken classes and lessons and with coaches, Andrea, different, I have done that. But that is what made me love myself again, you guys. I loved myself because I had to open up and let God in. And I had to say, Katrina, you can't take no step forward until you start loving yourself and loving God and realizing what you are to yourself. 
And that brought out loving yourself, no more abuse, which now I go out and I speak what I talk. It's not about me anymore. It's about, like Tiffany said, this show is called Surviving and Thriving. And that's what I do every day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate that, Ms. Karina. Um, we're going to move on because um, we have some other things to talk about. <laughs> some other things to talk about, um, but I want you guys to share your stories, but we have to be brief. Um, so next, Ms. Um, Lakeisha, can you share your story with us briefly? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Lakeisha. I am um, originally from Maryland, and I've been here in Charlotte six years now. Um, I am, I do consider myself a domestic violence survivor and thriver. Um, I was in an abusive relationship for a little over nine years. Um, and like Alicia, it took me to relocate from Maryland to actually feel okay. Um, it wasn't until I moved here that I like you ladies started loving myself again, um, started realizing that um, I am more than what I went through. Um, all of my family is still located in Maryland. Um, I do go back to visit every now and again, but I don't stay too long, only because I still feel in a box when I go back. Um, uh, the incident that caused me to officially say that I am done is when my son had to protect me from him. That was the last straw. Um, that is not a child's job. A child's job is to be happy and to enjoy life and to see mommy enjoy life and daddy enjoy life. But, um, seeing that was, that really broke my heart. Um, and so what I did was I packed my stuff and I left. Um, it took a lot of courage for that, um, being the position that he holds there. Um, it took a lot of courage for me to just up and leave, knowing that he could probably find me. Um, but as time has gone on, um, I feel in some ways I'm still healing from that. Um, but as Andrea said, I feel like there aren't a lot of resources. Um, Going through that, I really couldn't talk. I mean, I talked to my friends about it. I talked to my family about it. Everybody always says, you know, why don't you just leave? You know, but it's not that easy. It's it's definitely harder than just to say, I'll just leave. It's okay. It's not. It's the hardest decision any woman has to make is to walk away from a domestically violent relationship. Um, and everybody has their reasons, you know, for why they stay. And then we all have our reasons for why we leave. Um, but I think there needs to be more resources out here. There needs to be a place. There needs to be more people. There's, it just needs to be a larger scale of awareness, not just for a month, that domestic violence is very real. And it comes in all shades, all colors, all shapes, all sizes. It's not just physical, it's emotional and it's mental. Um, and so my reason for being so open recently, because technically when I moved here, I didn't want to talk about it. I wanted to leave it in Maryland. I didn't want to reflect on what I had been through. I didn't want to publicize it. I didn't want to relive that, but I realized you know, connecting more with Tiffany and Butterfly Visions and the Speak Up and Inspire series, I have to say something. I can't just leave it in my journals that I used to write in. And we all have the platform to do that. So um, I thank Tiffany for inviting me to this panel and to Butterfly Visions and Speak Up and Inspire, because if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be talking. So I just think we all need to um, take this and run with it. And I'm not going to let that define me. This, what we're doing now is what's going to define me. So I thank you for having me. Thank you. I'm so honored to have you. I'm so honored. Um, Ms. Radia, can you share your story with us briefly? Oh, you're on mute, baby. Hi, Queens. There you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so I'm Radia, and I was actually separated from my husband and decided I was going to date, and I got a, a boo. 
So, yeah. Um, I want to piggyback off of what she said. It means a lot that we kind of unite and, you know, show other women that they can talk about it because that was a big deal for me. Nobody knew even after I still didn't talk about it for a long time. Even now with, with several accomplishments regarding domestic violence, I still sometimes shy away from the mic when it comes to my story, but I'm, I'm really quick to tell somebody else, you know, how to help get over there. So it helps me to hear you guys say that. Um, so I just thank you for having me. As always, I appreciate you. Thank you. I was going, I was going to be brief. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. So Nicole, um, if you can share your story with us and um, very briefly, but then I'm also going to ask you, I'm going to put you on the spot at the end. I would like for you to share your poem with us. Okay. If that's okay with you. All I right. am honored. <laughs> Thank you. So Miss Nicole, please tell us briefly about your story. Okay, briefly about my story. First, I do have to add, I'm also known as Doll Lady Laureate at the Queen C Dolls under the Dolls of Faith. And I'm that's also nice. a board member of Miss Tiffany, which I'm honored with <laughs> Butterfly Vision Project as a mentor and youth advocate. And that was beautiful, Lakeisha. And I have to add that because at the end, all of that is going to play what you said, sisterhood and thriving. And my story was this Brooklyn girl, always spending the South Carolina uh, summer times with my biological father, up in North with my mom and my dad, but you know, back and forth. And so many failed relationships. I mean, I was engaged with this young man from the time I was 16 to 21. And after I, my heart was broken, that was it. So when I moved down South and I had my oldest son, and this man came to me, wooing me and everything else. I was like, you know what, God, maybe you sent this for me. You know, all I want is a happy family to raise my, ch my children, and, you know. And the first week after we got married, he busted my left eardrum, all because he cursed me. And this broken girl ain't gonna have nobody cursing her back. So I cursed him back. Like, who you think you're talking to? And he said, pop. All I heard was ringing. That was the first time. Tommy pushed me out the car. Tommy put a gun in my head, said, if you ever leave me, I will kill you. The time after he decided, now when I have children. See, when I said this man took me in, he accepted me and my son, he used that same, same thing against me. Oh, now you have three boys. Nobody wants you. You're not this, you're not that. You're supposed to be home, barefoot, and pregnant. That's it cooking, doing my duties. And what really got me, what really made me leave is I kept praying to God, help me, help me, help me. After all the abuse, after all the surgeries, after everything. I remember 4th of July, fell, hit my head over the bathtub, causing me to have C3, C4, herniated disc, bulging out to the point where, oh, if anything happened, you'll be paralyzed. Now they want to rush for me to have operation on it. But what got me was I remember we was at a party and it was his sisters. We used to always have these big cookouts, oyster roast and everything. And we was at his sister's, um, one of his brother's house and we got into an argument. We were playing spades and he wanted to leave. And I'm like, you wanna leave? Like I'm leaving too. Well, I'm taking the car. Well, we don't live too far cause we all lived around the same area. I'm walking. He took a Heineken bottle and hit it upside my head and blood started gushing. All the brothers, all the men there, they all was getting towels and band-aid and everything else. When I, they were in the bathroom cleaning me up, right? The sisters, cousins, all of them was in the kitchen. And all I heard them say, she's stupid. She the one still there, but y'all knew what he was doing to me. Y'all didn't pull me out. Y'all didn't save me. Y'all knew I had those children. And even though I had those children who were your, ne your nephews, you still didn't come save me. You still didn't think about me. And it took me, that, and my aunt to tell me, oh, when I told her that story, she said, well, you're gonna stay. Those were women. But when my aunt said that, that gave me the strength to say, okay, these women didn't think nothing about me. And so I, by the strength of God, Little by little, I started telling the people that I was closest that they couldn't believe it, but they also helped get me out. And that's what made me start my life over. And everything, once I left him, everything, I, I started writing 
was I would write my pain in poetry. And it wasn't until I shared that domestic violence poem is when I knew I wasn't alone, like everybody else said. And then it wasn't until I came here to Charlotte and started meeting so many other women that was like me. That's what allowed me to continue to thrive and share my story and do what I do. For this is not just for this month. We need to stop the silence now. And I am proud to call y'all queens my sisters. I love y'all. Thank you so much, Ms. Nicole. Thank you. Um, so I heard a lot of um, uh, things from each and every one of you that were pretty consistent. So I wanna share with you guys very briefly um, my screen and I'm gonna show it. And so, can y'all see this? Mm -mm. Not yet. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, what I want you to do is, I want you to raise your hand if you experienced any of these signs in your relationship. So, the first one is extreme jealousy, controlling behavior, quick involvement. Mm -hmm unrealistic expectations, mm -hmm. isolation, which I heard a lot of, blames others, mm -hmm. hypersensitivity, cruelty to animals or children, playful use of force of sex, which I heard a couple of times, verbal abuse, that Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde attitude or personalities. Past history of battering. And one of the last ones that are listed here is use of violence and threats of violence. Yes, ma'am. So almost probably 90% of us raise our hands more than once. And I would say a good more than half of us raise their hands for almost every single one. So I wanted to read those so that people that are watching um, see the different signs of abuse and that these signs, which there are many signs, but these signs right here across the board are some of the common signs that you are in an abusive relationship. And I just want to make sure that we share that there are different types of abuse, which I think that people fail to realize is that there are different types of abuse and it's not just physical. So Alicia, tell us another form of abuse that you dealt with, just one. Financial. Miss um, Radia, what's another form of abuse otherwise in financial and physical? You're on, you're on mute, baby. Um, a lot of verbal, verbal, a lot of verbal, a lot yes. of verbal. Yes, ma'am. Miss Katrina, what is something else that you um, dealt with in your relationship? Sexual. Yes, ma'am. Miss Nicole, do you have any others to add to it? Mentally. Yes, ma'am. And what about you, Miss Lakeisha? If we didn't say them already. <laughs> Emotional. Emotional. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is is that a person's status. So you have boyfriends that have been abusive on this panel. We have husbands that have been abusive. Um, we have uh, community figures in the, um, in the community that people are supposed to look up to that have been abusive. Um, and then we have family members. Uh, we have a son-in-law or a boyfriend to a daughter that was abusive. So, Abusers come in different forms, different types. They're not just your boyfriend or your girlfriend. They're not just your husband or your wife. They're not just your, you know, the, the next door bad boy. A lot of times the person comes in the form of whining and dining. And I know that all of us know about that. Yes. 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 They come on strong. They want a relationship real quick. And then that's when the fun begins unfortunately. And then after they do the whining and dining and now you're their man or you're their woman, then they start to isolate you from everybody that you care about and that you love. 
So I just want that to sit for a second. We really do need to understand that there's so many different forms of domestic violence that is not just physical. And we have a panel of ladies who have experienced every single form. And unfortunately, we have a mother here who lost her daughter. Statistics say that if there is a gun in the home where there's domestic violence, that the chance of homicide or DV related homicide goes up 500%. Not 100%, not 200%, 500%. So if there is a gun in the house, the likelihood of the DV relationship ending in homicide goes up 500%. That's something that we, we need to think about. If you don't mind me asking, um, Alicia, how old were you when your the abuse started with your partner? Oh, um, I was not thirty yet. I was like in my late twenties. Okay. What about yeah. you? Um, yeah. Was, okay. What about you, Katrina? It was like in my mid thirties. Mid thirties. What about you, Radia? Honey, this was so recent. <laughs> Yeah, too recent. Yeah, too recent. Okay, so we have late twenties, we have thirties. What about you, Keisha? I was nineteen. Ooh, nineteen. What about you, Miss Nicole? Twenty six. Twenty six. And Miss um, Andrea, how old was your daughter when she was in this abusive relationship? You're on mute. She was early twenties. Early twenties. Early twenties. So when I was looking at statistics today, it was saying women between the ages of 18 and 24 are the highest rate or what I say, the age that is most, that first experiences um, domestic violence. But that number has gone down. Now it's 16 to 24. Mm -hmm. Wow. So Miss Ms., uh, Merriman, from, from a mother's point of view, what can you tell us, people that are watching us, the panelists, what can you tell us as a mother to look out for with your daughters or our daughters or our sons? And, you know, and as a mother, for the most part, we know what to look out for. The, the isolation starts, the, the change in attitude, um, the less frequent seeing, and even in, in teens, and you know, we have Teen Dating Violence Month coming up in February. And I always say that those are two things that don't even need to go together. When you think of teens, you shouldn't even be able to say dating violence together. Right. But it's happening so prominent because as I believe it was Miss Lakeisha said, you know, as, as in, when you're young, you, that's what you know. You know, we've all said that's what you know, and and people see. So I say, as a mother, be conscious of what you're showing, because that's that old saying that what you do speaks so loud that what you say I cannot hear. Mm -hmm. So you can tell your daughters to be in a healthy relationship. You can tell your sons not to abuse women, but if all they're seeing is the arguing, the fussing, the fighting, the manipulating. Um, the mom being silenced because she don't want to start the argument. When they see those things, they it says children that are growing up in a domestic violence situation, 60% of them will either be the abuser or abused. 60%. So really, as a mother, we need to have that conversation um, so that, and, and I, I even tell my daughter, you know, she was in that situation for four months, but it got worse. But even with that, just keeping that communication open to where your son and your daughter, whichever it is, feel comfortable coming and saying, something don't feel right. Yeah. 
and talk about those red flags that we ignore. Because I know each and every one of us has been in a toxic relationship. I don't talk about mine, but you know, there's some back there anyway, because we all start dating projects from the beginning of dating. But if we go back and look and see that we started that way, but there was something that we ignored. And I say, just from a parent's point of view, start talking to your children about not ignoring the things that feel strange. When he seems too good to be true, he probably is. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I tell him one of the bigger things is, and especially it starts, and you said the time goes back to 16. You guys remember when you first met that person and you were so excited because he listened? Y'all talked all night long. What's that old song? You hang up. Now you hang up. Now you hang up. <laughs> Y'all remember them conversations, right? <laughs> and you're thinking, oh, he really cares. So he's really listening. But we fail to see that at that time, he's listening so he can regurgitate those same thoughts and feelings back to you so you can think that he knows you. Uh. Mm-hmm. If he is listening more than he's talking, he's setting you up. And so that's my thing to talk to your kids about, Um, especially from a point of view of a mother, is to just have those conversations about those type things. You can't say, oh, he ain't no good. You know, that ain't going to work. But just start saying, if he's listening more than he's talking, if you feel the red flags, if he don't get along with nobody, you can't fix him. Mm-hmm. Yes, True. Ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, Can I get something? Yes, ma'am. Because I know, like, when I was in the situation and I used to tell my daughters, well, all my kids, don't ever, what I'm going through, don't ever let someone treat you the same way. And what really hit me hard was when my daughter was like, well, mommy, why are you doing it? Why are you letting somebody treat you like that if you don't want us to do it? And at the time, the only answer I could give her was because right now, mommy do not love herself like I need to love me. And I just don't want y'all to have to go through what I'm going through. And because I knew they seen it because I seen it. So I accepted it when I was, you know, oh, that's what I see my mother go through. And she never came to me and was like, this is not what you, this is not acceptable. She just didn't have that conversation with me. So it's like one day I just had the conversation with them. And even though they say, well, why are you doing it? And I didn't leave right away. It still was like, because right now, mommy is just, my self-esteem is not where it's at to be strong enough to not deal with it. And I'm just letting y'all know, be able be stronger than me and be able to know that this is not how you're supposed to be treated because you're right children they see what your actions is more than what they hear what you're telling them not to do that is so true like if they constantly seeing you do something you say don't do this and it's like well why you keep doing this so i want to try to do it (laughs) so you're right about that and you have to let them know you know just saying, like you said, oh, he's not good for you. Okay, well, what makes him not good for me? What is the signs that I need to look for to know he's not good for me? Because sometimes when you just say certain things, they think, oh, you don't know. He loves me. I got to figure it out on my own. And it's like, you don't want to push them to the person by telling them, no, I don't want you messing with them. You can't see that person no more. That's not going to get them away from the person either. So it's all about being open and having that really good conversation on a consistent basis and knowing that, okay, all right, we haven't talked in a while. What's going on to know that y'all have that type of relationship to let your children know, hey, how you really feeling? How is he really, how is you really being treated? Because it don't, you're not who you, who I know you are. Right. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I just wanted to ask, and because this is true for me, um, I've been in several um, abusive relationships from physical to sexual to mental, emotional. Um, and it started, the abuse for me started for me starting as a child. So um, if you 
are open to sharing if you would raise your hand if you experienced or witnessed abuse as a child and I'll raise my hand mm -hmm. no, I did. yeah so just that's what you just um you just said Miss uh, Alicia that you know sometimes we grow up learning about abuse in our own homes and we wonder I know for me I used to think that my mom was so weak that my dad was constantly like cheating on her. He wasn't abusive uh, in other ways, but it, mentally and emotionally, he was abusive. Um, you know, being in relationship, being in relationships after relationships, I was, I was, I lost my virginity to rape. So I, I at, as a teenager, so that was my first experience with men. And so I was in abusive relationship, abusive relationship over and over and over again until I had to step back and say, this, this is not right. This is not the way, this is not love. This is not how relationships are supposed to be. But I was drawn to men who were very strong and, you know, very, this is my home and, you know, so forth. I saw, I saw those things as a child. And so that's what I thought men were supposed to be like. Um, and even though I, I love my father to death and, um, but he was able to admit to me before he passed that he did a lot of things wrong and he wished that he could take those things back. Um, and so that's another, that's something else that we need to talk to our children about or be aware of with our children is that if we have them in abusive, abusive homes, abusive relationships, that not only is it, it's not only affecting us, it's affecting them as well. And if we don't teach them that this is not the way healthy relationships look, then the likelihood of them getting into abusive relationships is very high. So yeah. as mothers, I know Keisha, you said that your son had to defend you. Um, you know, my babies, they were too young to witness the arguing and the fighting and so forth. But I know Katrina, your son was there. He was in the home and Miss Nicole, your son was there. Um, Miss Alicia, your son was there. And unfortunately, Miss Merriman, your, your daughter was in an abusive relationship. Um, you were strong ladies and I commend you all for getting out of that. Um, and from listening to your stories, a lot of you said that the reason why you got out is because of your children. Either your children spoke up, they had to defend you or they were seeing way too much. So I commend mm -hmm. you for that being your reason to get out because so mm -hmm. many women or men do not get out of the relationship. And mm -hmm. despite the fact that their children are watching um, for whatever reason. Um, I also wanna commend you all because for me before I used to say, why is she staying? I'm sure people ask y'all that too. Why does she stay? Why is she still there? What is she doing? Mm -hmm. If I was in that situation, I would get out. Or if I was in that situation, this, or I was in that situation, that. Easier it's not that easy. Easier it's said not that easy. Yeah. It's not it's that easy. easy. Until you experience it, you exactly. cannot judge no, no, no how long they stay. Okay. You we have can't. to really be in that situation to understand where any of us ladies came from with that. I, yes. I can't stand that for one. I can't stand that. And you know, I'm sorry, Tiffany, I mean to cut you off, sis. No, you're fine. That, that makes me mad because for the simple fact that people are so judgmental, you understand? And they the first one to say, well, I wouldn't do that. And I wouldn't take that for him. Honey, I'll be upside his head. No, you wouldn't, right? Because a man be is- right strong. there in the same spot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. exactly. A man is strong. Look, I, I'm a thick girl, sister now, but I was small then. So how <laughs> in the world was I going to take on this well-built man? You understand? You you can't you can't say that. And I think it's vital that we stop doing that. You know, people stop doing that to us because you're showing your daughters like, mm -hmm. come on, you can stand up to him. No, that's not that's not right. Don't ever try to fight them. Don't do mm -hmm. it because this is how so many are losing their life now. I mean, we have to find other measurements and we have to follow the guidelines that all of us as advocates, all of us as coaches, whatever it may title we hold, we have to show them a better way of doing it for them and their safety of themselves and their children. 
You mm. can't just tell people, get up and just pack your bag, girl, and go. Go to the hotel. Where, where Where's the security at the hotel? They ain't thinking about right. what your situation nope. is. Right. They thinking about their money. They not thinking about trying to save your life. So you have to think before you take action and tell people something that you know you didn't even do back then. So why would you tell them to do that? Right. Right. Miss Radia, um, I remember you were sharing your story um, when we had your interview before, where you said that you ran out of your house to a neighbor's house, I believe. And what was her response? I remember you telling us that. And I was just like, what? What was the what was your neighbor's response when you she ran out said, of your house? Uh, she said, um, I, I don't know why you're here and he's still there. Which I get what she meant um, now, but in that moment, it was almost like a slap in the face. Um, so I guess it goes back to what the other young lady was saying. Well, you're not used to being loved up on. We don't know what that looks like. Um, we don't know what that feels like. So sometimes anything feels great and it feels like the mirage. And in my situation, being married for so long um, and then coming out of that and being by myself, I was quick to gravitate towards anything that looked like love um yeah. so i think it's important to point out that we got as women and our young girls um we got to love up on each other a lot more because we're missing that and we're looking i know tiffany you just said about your dad um i was a total opposite because i didn't have that growing up so i gravitated still towards that dominant male um which in turn now because of the domestic violence and because of some of the things i went through with men I'm the total opposite. So now I'm the dominant person. Um, and sometimes that's not good. I think I use it as a crutch, um, almost a, a protection kind of thing. So it's a lot cut that comes with even um, some of you guys situations. I don't like to downplay anybody's um, are a lot more horrific than mine. I, I lasted seven months, almost about nine months, maybe. Um, and I and I had to find a way to figure something else out. And I think that's what made me who I am now. Um, I think that made me extra super strong. Um, so I kind of thank God for my, my episode because I call that's what it was, my episode of amnesia of not remembering who I am. Um, and now I'm able to share that with other people and that's the rush for me. So just I just want to just love up on everybody and make sure they love up on somebody so we know what that looks like and we know what that feels like and we know what to expect from a man and what to give. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, it's, it's really important that when we leave abusive relationships that we learn to love ourselves. Yes. Because when after being in an abusive relationship, a lot of times, most times you lose yourself because they took that from you. Um, mm -hmm. you lose yourself. Your self-esteem is low because they've called you every name in the book. Um, they've taken, you know, isolated you from your family, people that love you. So the only thing you, the only thing that looks like love is what he shows you, which is not love. Um, you know, and really taking the time to reflect. And Miss Merriman, I'm about to get get into get into you for a second with that one. We're gonna come back to you in just a second. <laughs> I don't want to cry just yet, um, <laughs> but um, we really need to take the time, to, you know, to love love ourselves and and get back in touch with us and what makes us the woman that we are. And I know that all of you have done that, and um, that's the reason why you're here because you're thriving. You're you're an overachiever, as Miss uh, Katrina said. You have achieved and you have survived something horrific that nobody should have to go through, male or female, um, but. I remember, was it Miss Alicia, I believe, she said that it starts from within. Becoming a survivor and overcoming and getting to the point where you can be an advocate and a thriver, it starts with your mental state. Yes. You have to get in touch with your mental state because if you mentally continue being a victim, you will never get past it. You will never grow. You will never learn to love yourself enough to not let anyone abuse you. Um, you have to get healthy mentally first so that you can understand that you were a victim and that you were in a domestic violence relationship and take the blinders off, take the blinders off and realize that no matter if he's not hitting you, that doesn't mean that he, it's not an abusive relationship. Yeah. Um, so I think that all of us have had the opportunity to do that. And that's why you are here talking to our friends and our family today. So um, before I get to Miss Merriman, I'm just going to ask you, and I'm, I'm going to say brief, 
ladies. Come on now. I'm brief. Before you <laughs> brief. Because <laughs> we're going over our time. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Tiffany, before you do that, I want to add to what you were saying. Because mm -hmm. if you don't get your, if you really don't reflect and get your mental together, you're going to fall in that trap. Like with me, I went from one abusive relationship to the next abusive relationship. And then instead of me getting my mental thing, I just was like, well, I'm going to just, maybe it was my mouth that got me in trouble. Maybe it was my mouth because I like to be, hey, you can't tell me what to do. And maybe that's why I got hit. Or maybe that's why he treated me like that. So I went to another relationship thinking if I was to shut myself down even lower, then I wouldn't be abused. But what it did was intensified it because I still wasn't, I didn't love me. So I still, that's who I attracted. I attracted someone that's really not good for me. And it caused me to have a worse situation than the last one. So you have to get in a position where it's like, what do I want for me? Not what can somebody do for me, but what do I want for me that's going to really help me grow inside, mentally, physically, emotionally, all around, so that you know what you your worth is. Right. Right. Yes. So I'm gonna get to Miss Merriman. I'm gonna try not to cry. So Miss <laughs> um, Merriman um, must have saw me on my soapbox one day. And she told me that she needed to talk to me and she did. Um, and she was very, very frank with me. And she told me that I needed to um, look within. I needed to check myself. And that's, that's not the word she said, but she said I needed to, <laughs> to, to have a reality check with myself. Um, and so she asked me to do something and I highly encourage everyone to do this. Even if you are here and thriving, that sometimes you have to check in with yourself. So, Miss Merriman, can you tell us what what it is that you challenged me to do? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, first, I want to let me let me make a brief comment on something you guys have touched. And I just want to um, reiterate a quick fact before I answer that, if that's okay. I know we're yeah. pressed for time. But I, heard, I keep hearing, I was looking for that dominant person. I was looking for that dominant person. And one of the modules and one of the things that I talk to people, especially teens about, is that's part of what we go looking for because that's what we think we need. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. So I want to say that that's okay. But what we need to understand is there's a fine line between the dominant and the abuser. And when we ignore, and I heard uh, Lisa say that she kept attracting those people because of the lack of self-esteem and, and self-love, but she still kept looking for that dominant person, thinking that that person was, the next one was going to be the answer. So I say that to all of us, women that are out there looking for someone to that we can be a help meet for is that if you don't ignore the things we said before you may end up with a dominant person and not the abuser but know that it's okay to still look for a dominant person and it's okay to submit because the whole idea of a relationship is that it's give and take and that you don't have to be and that person, you don't have to be a doormat, but know it's okay to be able to, to have a downtime. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to share that because I hear it a lot, especially talking to teens, is that they think they need to be one or the other. Right. And it's not, it should be a give and take type thing. So that was my first thing. The second thing, as Tiffany said, what she went through, as I explained to her, is I have a what I say, was it seven day or five day challenge? Seven. <laughs> seven. Seven day challenge. And and it's I'm more about mindfulness. <laughs> Just be mindful because what I found, as I said at the beginning, my job is to disrupt the normalcy of domestic violence and to provide training workshops and challenges to advocates and servant leaders so that they can continue to serve those that need it. So in part of that, I need you and I speak to you guys as you guys here and all leaders 
to be more mindful of the things we say, and we spoke about some of them today, Katrina's hit on them quite a bit. But also what I found is when we are abused, we start pressing down our feelings. I believe that by, na by, by nature, women are nurturers. And that's why we start looking for projects to date. Well, people don't understand him like I do. His family didn't treat him right. And I understand him. You know, we'll, we start making excuses for their things that they do. And then when it starts happening, we start saying, as Alicia just said, start saying, okay, if I just be quiet, if I just don't express my feelings, well, I'm a survivor, so it, as long as my children are okay, I'm okay. And so we just stop feeling. But what happens when you go through the challenge and you start being more mindful of your feelings, you start understanding why you do some of those things. And then you see how different things trigger you and how you respond to different things. And by being more mindful of your feelings, which women don't like to do because we've been told in the corporate world that if we are emotional, we be, we're called names that start with Bs. We're called all kinds of things when we are showing our emotions or our passion for something. But when you become more mindful of those feelings, you learn how to control those feelings in a way that is advantageous to you but sometimes it brings up some things, don't it, Tiffany, that you it weren't sure ready does. for. Mm -mm. <laughs> Those, that was a long seven days. <laughs> but it was a good seven days. <laughs> but it's just, some, I just think that it's something that as a leader, especially leaders that are giving back, telling your story, because what people don't understand is they think that you just want to get online and tell your story. But they fail to forget that each time you tell that story, you relive it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That you're giving a little bit more of yourself to somebody mm -hmm. else. And a wall, a little bit of that wall come down again. Mm -hmm. So to do that, you know, and then as you work with people, you start hearing their stories. Now, each of you have heard something. And then you start dealing with the vicarious trauma from somebody else's stories. And then things, you just don't look at the world like you used to no more. And we don't understand why unless we're continuing to be mindful of our thoughts and how it really makes us feel. I'm a firm believer that you can't heal from something you can't identify. Mm -hmm. I used to have a friend that used to say all the time, I'm feeling some kind of way. You can't <laughs> heal from some kind of. <laughs> you've got to really identify but see that's something we don't want to do we don't want to have the tough conversations with ourselves let alone the community but it needs to start with the tough conversations with ourselves and I know I wasn't brief but we already over <laughs> Well, I'm glad that y'all are sticking on, and I think it's worth being over. Um, we have people that are commenting who who are saying, wow, that this is helping them. So as long as y'all are here, I'm here. Um, but we are going to go ahead and, and try to wrap it up a little bit. And how I would like for us to end is um, briefly, ladies. <laughs> That's the word tonight, briefly. Briefly. Okay, yes. we got you. We, we, we got you. <laughs> Tell me in two yes. minutes or less. Yes, yes. Tell me and everyone that's watching, how are you thriving today? What are you doing that that you are thriving today um, as a survivor? You, you're a survivor, you're past this, you're advocates now, you're in the community. Tell us how you're thriving today, whether you're an author, whether you're a coach, whether you're a poet. Tell us how are you thriving today? And I'm going to start with Miss Radia. Oh me! Oh, you just oh, need look out, girl. I'm trying to. I'm trying to put a plug in there for you. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so um, honestly, before I went through, and just to go back to your question really quick, and I am going to be brief. Um, <laughs> my, I went 
through this in 2016, 17, and I'm 47. So sometimes those age numbers don't match up to me. Um, so I look at that. I think we need to dig more into the realm of the older women. There are a lot of older women outside of that 18 to 24 dealing with domestic violence. Um, so yeah. I just wanted to plug that in and let you know that it, it, that's how recent it was for me. Um, yeah. And I, did, I wasn't doing much of anything before that. I was going through some things in my marriage. I was a home housewife, you know, just at home, not really doing much fulfilling um, in my career or did I even really have one at the time. But after that, um, I always say I had to go through hell to get to heaven. Almost like I kind of had to have that butt whipping, you know, God had to literally come in and strangle me and say, listen, you know, get your life. Um, so yeah, I put out three books. Um, I'm about to fly to LA and shoot a video with a girlfriend of mine next week. Um, I got some, a whole lot of other projects coming up. So I say each punch, each slap I took, um, not only did it help me remember who I was and help somebody else remember who they are, but it got me some paper and, and you know, <laughs> for extra pairs of shoes and stuff. So, um, uh, along with the peace of mind um, of being able to accomplish some of those things because I had to just couldn't let him win and had to say, you know, you got some kind of purpose. I, I like to pat myself on the back because I did those things. So, <laughs> to him. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, because a lot of I'll probably every abuser that on this panel, um, include, including the, the boyfriend of uh, Miss Merriman's uh, daughter, um, I'm sure they, they put, put you down, they call you all kinds of names, they love to call you the B word, um, so forth and so on. And they, they really, really covet your self esteem. So I'm happy that you were able to achieve so many things um, after surviving what you survived, Mr. Dia. Tell us your book that you just um, launched. And we'll move on to um, to our next panelist. I just launched a Resurrection in Heels. It's on Amazon now. Um, I hope you guys like it. It's just a short anthology um, with some ladies that were telling their stories as well. And we kind of put them together. And we focused more on the come up and how we were able to remember that. Like I always say, Tiffany, it wasn't so much about what he did but why we didn't think we were enough. So we wanted to emphasize that in the book that, you know, if we could do it, y'all can too. So go to Amazon okay. and get it. It's pretty good. Thank you. Thank you. And, I'm, and make sure, um, uh, Ms. Radia, you drop the link in the comments for this live. Um, okay, I Ms. Sure Keisha, will. thank you. Ms. Keisha, tell us, how are you thriving? Um, it's hard to say. Um, like I said before, I'm not, I'm just becoming vocal in my story. Um, so I'm still learning. Um, I commend you ladies for everything that you, know, you do, not just for us, but just for the community and for our young ladies and our older ladies. We, we need more conversations like this. Um, so I'm taking it all in and I'm trying to be, I want to be more active and I want to be more vocal. So I'm, I think at this point, I'm just, I'm learning. Um, I do have some health things going on right now. So I'm dealing with that too, but I, I'm not going to stop talking. And that's just that. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's how you're, you're thriving. You're talking, you're speaking <laughs> up, girl, you're speaking <laughs> up. Accomplishment. <laughs> I love it, it is. It is an accomplishment. It's a big accomplishment. Miss um, Alicia, how are you thriving? I'm thriving be, by um, coaching others to learn to love themselves inside and out. I have, it was called the self-love challenge, but I changed it to a self-love journey because it's a process. It's a journey that you go through. It's no longer, you're not challenging yourself no longer. It is a journey. So I wanted to change the name to self-love journey, um, journey instead of challenge. And putting that out there, hashtag me first. I also, um, not only am I part of your organization, I'm also part of another organization called Gracious Hands, where I do group coaching sessions with the ladies there to help them push through the pain. I also working on me I'm always the personally developing me like I do kickboxing and I love it oh my god I love it and you know, <laughs> that alone I can with the kick to go me ahead. with boxing and the fitness but I'm I was always on a health journey um health journey with I changed my diet the way I eat 
me being with wellness, meditating, praying. It's just all a process and me doing that because constantly when you come out of a relationship like that, you have to work on yourself. So I'm constantly working on myself every single day. I'm constantly learning new things. I'm constantly being certified to do new things because I'm pushing myself to want more. It's like, okay, I got this certification. I want something else now. So it's like, I'm constantly wanting more and more. And then when, as I'm learning more, I want to show and teach others more because I don't want to be selfish with it. I want everyone else to know, look, you can do this too. You want to try this? You can do that. You know, because I'm here to help others. And I, that I know that's why I'm here. And be, me just doing something for myself is selfish. So, and I'm all about, not not when I'm talking about my personal development. That's that's not selfish. That's all about learning who you are to help others. So, yeah, yeah that's what I'm doing. That's how I'm thriving. That's how I'm growing. Yeah, very nice. Self care is so important, especially as advocates and survivors and yeah. um, being community leaders. Self care is very important, very very important. Um, Miss Merriman, I know you've already talked about it, but how are you thriving? I just basically, as I said, working through my um, Jennifer Y. Merriman Help Program. Help stands for Hope Empowerment Life Skills and Prevention Methods. Um, I'm now certifying coaches to actually facilitate that in their area. My goal is to have this 555,000 in the next five years, have the program in all 50 states and serve 50, I mean, 5,000 families. So that's kind of what I'm doing and working on that and just basically doing um, self-development person personal development things with um, coaches and advocates so that they can have the support they need to continue and if you don't mind I have a free um, pdf that people can download and it's uh, bit.ly forward slash 12 tips 60 and it's 12 personal development tips to jumpstart your advocacy career so if someone's new or they're in a space that they're kind of at a plateau, they the tips will help them kind of see where they are and move past that. Very nice. Very nice. Um, I'm going to ask all of you to make sure you drop your links in the comments so everybody can see it. Um, Miss Katrina, how are you thriving? Girl, I had to take a break for a minute. Me and Andrea met and I told her about it. I had to take time for me um, because... As everybody know, I'm constantly traveling and doing this and that. I had to sit down and say, hey, girl, it's time to take a break. And I had to learn to meditate. I had to learn me inside and out again. I had to redevelop my mindset. So I did a lot to take me forward. As Alicia said, I do a lot of things to just meditate. I had to teach myself again to let go and let God, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. You can't handle everything. You can't carry everything on your shoulder. Um, with that being said, I've also started my mentor program with the younger um, children. I've I even had women now that I coach and talk to. And I'm also always, I'm always investing in myself. I'm taking classes. I'm getting ready to take Andrea Merriman's class in January. So, you know, I'm doing things to invest in me because if I don't invest in me, how can I invest in anybody else? That's me. So my slogan now to people is I lived and learned and now I'm learning to live. Mm -hmm. Yes, I love that. I love that. I really do. Ms. Katrina, you um, you have been um, an exceptional friend to me and mentor. So I'm so proud of you for, for all that you're doing. Um, Ms. Nicole, last but not least, how are you thriving? Um, one day at a time. Thank you, Lord, by the grace of God. <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. do everything for the, for the one poem that started the book. So I wrote two books, Butterfly Called Rainbow, Searching for Love in All the Wrong Places, um, that is on Amazon. From that book, it led me to domestic violence advocacies in New Jersey. And from there, it led me to, um, especially New Light in Image, that groomed me. That it was not only um, therapeutic. And from that, coming to Charlotte, sharing my story and sharing my book and meeting everybody else and 
the McNeils and, and, and sharing it, that allowed me to thrive, to meet in Tiffany somehow, to meet in Belinda mm -hmm. through the Queen City Dolls House and um, in the community under Elite Dolls of Faith. And with them, um, I'm known, also known as Doll Lady Laureate. We go into the community, we give back to the homelessness, the shelters, the women, especially we give, um, they have also a God's Gift Baby Ministry. We give clothings to the women in need for their children or essential items, pampers. Um, then we joined, we, we're both on the board with Butterfly Vision Projects and they collaborate and we have donations coming in also through them. And through Butterfly Vision Project, I'm also an advocacy through the youth and mentor. And um, so all of that helped me thrive because I'm able to share my story. And because of my children, myself, of what we went through, I'm able to relate to the youth and I'm able to relate to the woman. And then I'm able to give back to the, everybody else because when we first left, we didn't have anybody else. So that's how I was able to thrive. Like Miss Merriman said, the more I started giving and giving and giving it, even though I felt like I should have been taking care of myself, it just felt like by me giving of myself was taking care of myself because it was another wall falling down. And so that's how I continue to thrive. Very nice, very nice. Thank you so much for sharing, um, ladies. Um, we are gonna end tonight with Miss Nicole sharing her poem, um, which got her to start opening up about her experience as a survivor. So Miss Nicole, can you go ahead and, and close us out with your poem, please? Yes. First, no copyright infringement. If you hear the theme of the music real quick, it's from the theme of A Woman's Worth, Alicia Keys. You can buy me diamonds. You can buy me pearls. Take me on a cruise around the world, but just don't hit your girl. You can buy me diamonds. You can buy me pearls. Take me on a cruise around the world, but just don't hit your girl. He said, girl, I love you. I am going to make you my wife. I can't see myself being without you in my life. Falling into the trap of should be coming strong too fast, thinking that this newfound relationship was just destined to last. Charming me, loving me, captivating me with his smile, but not realize his captivity what he would keep me in after a while. See, after the honeymoon was over, then jealousy stepped in. No matter how much I secluded myself, I just couldn't win. Claiming that his blood, sweat, and tears is what it took to raise our family, but not realizing that those blood, sweat, and tears would be coming for me. Girl, I'm sorry. I love you. I won't do it again. I didn't mean to be so mean as he took for me more and more each day as he tried to get in between. By the time it was over, my body was used to inside and out. See, I conditioned myself to the point it was senseless for me to shout. I learned to shout on the inside, screaming, God, please help get me out. I kept hearing this voice saying, girl, you just got to leave. But he kept feeding me with those same old lines, convincing me to believe. Girl, I love you. You are my wife. But if you ever leave me, I will take your life. You can buy me diamonds. You can buy me pearls. Take me on a cruise around the world. But just don't hit your girl. He said, girl, I love you. I am going to make you my wife. I can't see myself being without you in my life. Thinking about my past, wonder if he'd be the same as the last. How would I know if I don't give him a chance? Wow. He said he loved me. He didn't have to ask me to be his wife. If it was me, him, and a million men, I'd say yes to him anytime. Two of a kind, hearts intertwined, combined to death through us part, rich or poor, even if I leave this earth before him, i still come in his dreams wanting him some more. He said, girl, I love you. Thank you for being my wife. I said, God, I love you. Thank you for saving my life. You can buy me diamonds. You can buy me pearls. Take me on a cruise around the world. But just don't hit you, girl. Just don't hit you, girl. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ladies.
Yes. For being on with us tonight. This is the one of the two last um, Speak Up and Inspire series episodes for year 2020. We take a break in um, November and December and we'll be back in January. So thank you so much. This was a great way to end October Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And also, I would like all of you to please keep Miss Keisha in your prayers. Um, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so um, please keep her in your prayers. Um, Please check in on her. Um, she's going to do well. She's a strong woman like all of us here on the panel. And I love her so much. So please keep her in your prayers as well. Everybody, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies, have a good night. And um, I appreciate you. And I love you all so much. Love you too. Love you. Bye. Good night, everybody. Bye, Merriman, sis. Bye-bye. Follow y'all, everyone. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. God bless. <laughs>